Hello, Garland Nixon here, and yes, our favorite time of the week has arrived. We've got the great Jody Brar. Let's talk. Hello, Garland and Jody Brar here. Uh, Jody, before we get going, where can everybody find you and all of your work online? Oh, thank you. Well, uh, my party's website is there, thecommunists.org. Uh, you can also find us on Telegram, The Communists. And I have a channel on Telegram called Jody Bra. Should be very easy to find me. There's the spelling there, Jody, J-O with a T, J-O-T-I. Um, also, um, I'm on Twitter, Jody2, number two, Gaza. And uh, our party is on Twitter. I think it's CPGBML. Wonderful. All right. So let's talk. Um, you know, one of the things that there's a number of things that I'd like to discuss, and that is something you've been working on lately. And that is what we've learned about the imperialists, what we've learned about imperialism at, uh, since the start of the special military operation. You know, before the SMO, the world was horrified of the U.S. and its vassals, right? Oh, my gosh, they're economically dominant, militarily. They're the most powerful, as they said. They had everybody brainwashed. We're the most powerful military that the world has ever seen, you know, all that kind of stuff. But once they got engaged with a country that has a legacy of survival, a legacy of struggle, yeah, they ran into a brick wall. What have we learned about the weakness of imperialism since the um, special military operation has started? Actually, so many things, Garland. I'm going to take them one by one because I'm sure you'll have interesting things to say. And if I don't, I'll just be ranting at you for an hour and that will be actually quite boring. <laughs> so um, just to put a little bit of context on it, you know, I think it's really important to remember that the launch of Russia's SMO uh, in February 2022 was not the beginning of the war, right? The war began when the US imperialists and the EU imperialists controlled a fascist clique and brought it to power, ousting the elected government in 2014. And what happened then was the east of the country rose up in an anti-fascist resistance. In many places that was crushed and put down, but in two uh, regions in the Donbass, Lugansk and Donetsk, uh, they were actually victorious. The soldiers there beat the Ukrainian army. Nobody really ever talks about that. But then there was a peace process to try to find a way to uh, create uh, a new status quo that would respect the rights of workers in the Donbass, the right to the Russian language, um, you know, not to be um, second class citizens inside a new kind of fascistic ethno state of Ukraine that was being shaped. Um, and some kind of peaceful uh, modus vivendi. Uh, and they, that was called the Minsk process, right? And Russia was one of the sponsors of Minsk, but all the others were Western countries. And they have since admitted that it was all a big lie, that process, right? They used the time to build up Ukraine. But when Russia launched the special military operation, finally came to the assistance of the, of the people fighting in the Donbass, there was a qualitative change in the war. Um, it was presented to us like this out of the blue Russian aggression, right? But actually it was Russia finally moving decisively against the imperialist aggressive project, having exhausted all the other avenues of diplomacy and dialogue. Um, and that really opened not only a new phase in the Ukraine war, but a new phase in the whole anti-imperialist struggle across the world. Um, you know, the USA, and the other imperialist powers have been driving uh, really desperately to war over, over more than a decade now. They are trying to get themselves out of the deepest ever global capitalist economic crisis. And they're trying to save their place at the top of the world and the, their ability to loot the world. Uh, they have so many financial problems that only a really big bonanza is going to help these parasites kind of get out of their problems. Um, and what they're looking for is the destruction and the dismemberment and the free looting of the resources of Russia and of China. Um, 
And also they want to remove Russia and China's ability to give fraternal aid to developing countries, because that's also impacting their ability to dominate and loot elsewhere in the world. So that's you have to understand the, 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 the rationale behind them putting so much effort into weaponizing Ukraine, that the, the war in Ukraine was never just about Ukraine. Yes, Ukraine is a good target in itself, has a lot of resources, but geopolitically, the US always saw it. And the imperialists for a century have seen Ukraine as a tool uh, that's, that should be weaponized and used to smash Russia. This is like an ongoing project. So for lots of people who weren't paying attention, it looked like it just came out of nowhere. And they were sort of um, uh, susceptible to the propaganda that said this crazy aggression, this is an imperialist move. Vladimir Putin's a madman, he's a dictator. He just woke up one morning and over his shreddies in the breakfast table went, oh, I think I'm gonna invade a peaceful country today. You know, of course that's not what actually happened. Um, and real anti-imperialists had actually been spending those eight years of war trying to show people what's really going on here and what's what's involved and what's at stake. Um, there were clear signs that the West was planning war against Russia for more than a decade. You know, so it shouldn't have been the shock that it was, but unfortunately there aren't enough people like us who are explaining that to people. So I think the first weakness that the SMO in particular, this new phase of the war where Russia was directly facing not just Ukraine, but in fact the entire um, uh, military and economic might of NATO, that's all of the imperialist camp combined and lots of their proxies and allies, right? The first and most important weakness that was exposed actually was economic weakness of the imperialist ca camp. Because now you and I have both talked about this different places and together, I'm sure, you know, when um, the SMO was launched in early 2022, the West immediately launched a, basically a sanctions blitzkrieg. It was really uh, um, intense economic warfare against Russia, no holds barred. And the expectation was this was going to very quickly cause so much pain to the Russian people Yes, collective punishment sanctions, right? And it was really horrific sanctions regime aimed at causing maximum human suffering to the Russian people in order that they would then come out on the streets and demand the removal of Vladimir Putin's government, right? And this would then allow the US to come in, install some kind of puppet that they like and pursue their agenda without the need for much more armed combat. And what happened? The war didn't just fail to succeed in its aims, you know, and we've talked about it many times. I've listened to you talking about it. It backfired completely. So they had anticipated a situation where they'd get a little bit of short term pain, you know, maybe a few months difficulty, while the West would temporarily, temporarily lose access to Russian oil and other Russian war materials that they really need. Uh, but that was going to be worth it because the long term result was going to be a massive carnival, an orgy of looting of the Russian people's resources, uh, pretty much like the one they got in the period following the fall of the USSR and the, and the collapse of socialism in Eastern Europe. When that didn't happen, what they got instead was long term pain for the West and especially for Europe. And in the meantime, Russia's economy didn't just withstand the initial shocks, which were tough, but was eventually strengthened by being cut off from Western investment. And one of the lessons you can learn from that is Western investment is actually Western blood sucking. <laughs> it's not an equal relationship. It doesn't do the recipient much good to have this money coming in because the wealth that's generated when this investment comes is all taken away. So the, what happens when, a, when the West invests in your country and you're a, a developing country is they bring their money, they set up some business, your labor works, your labor pr produces wealth, that wealth is then taken back abroad. So, you know, you're busy working, you end up poorer than ever. In the process of all this going on, the economic crisis that the imperialist countries we're trying to escape. Remember, this is what's driving them to war. Yes, they're in this deep, deep economic crisis and they're trying to find a way out of it. What's happened? They've made it worse. 
energy prices have got higher, inflation has there, therefore got worse kind of twice over, once because of the energy prices going crazy, and that puts up the price of everything, but also because of all the money printing that they're doing, um, which has again taken a massive upturn uh, because of sending money to Ukraine, right? And a lot of that money is just printed. European industry is becoming increasingly unviable, closing down, moving to other parts of the world. The cost of living for ordinary workers is climbing ever more steeply. And all of those things are fueling the political crisis that we see across the West. And I think one other aspect of the economic realities that we really should pay attention to uh, that's been highlighted by the, by the SMO is actually the absolute superiority of planning over market mechanisms. You know, for decades, you said it earlier, the world was just awed by the staggering dimensions of the USA's military budget. And we all assumed that the US armed forces must be overwhelmingly bigger, better equipped, mightier, more well-trained, more technically advanced than those of any other country. And surely by force of numbers, they would overpower anybody. Look how big their budget is compared to the next 10 countries combined, right? That's what we always used to see those graphs, didn't we? But the battlefield realities in Ukraine have shown us something really important. And steadily the drip, 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 the facts come out. And now we see that a huge portion of US military spending is generating profits for arms manufacturers and also going in bribes for acolytes and facilitators and hangers on, right? It's not going to make a good army. It's, it's just big, it's going straight into the coffers of you know, various profiteers. And it's a little bit for me, I draw the parallel with the USA's uh, health spending. You know, USA spends by far and away the most on health, right? But it doesn't, that massive spend doesn't deliver basic care to millions of US citizens, right? And we know it entails huge waste that's driven by corporate greed and corruption. Um, and US military spending is turning out to be like just the same, totally wasteful, totally unable to produce the basic items needed, right? Cheap and steady supplies of ammunition and small drones, for example, that really effective action in a peer-to-peer -peer war is going to demand. And what we are realizing is that in the post-Code War situation, uh, the USA came to consider itself as being like just untouchable, totally don totally dominant and unassailable. And the military chiefs and the arms companies in the USA, it, from what I can see, they stopped planning for war against a peer competitor. They focused instead on the kind of pseudo wars they've been fighting, where their maintenance stations, their air bases are all safe from attack. Their aerial power is totally dominant and unchallenged, yes. And the wars that they've been fighting, wars, um, they were the only ones with access to satellite communications and GPS systems, and that access could never be threatened, right? So they just had this technological and firepower dominance in all the theatres of war for a long time, and they, they have planned on that assumption. And if you combine those assumptions with the desire of the arms companies to maximise their profits, you've got this situation uh, where the USA has got a lot of really overpriced, very complex machines that aren't up to the really hard realities of a, of a battle where the other side also has access to technology that's just as good and very often better, where it has a, a really superior ability to replace what's been lost and damaged. Um, you know, we, we heard one of your congressmen recently describing F-35 fighter planes as $100 million paperweights. Right? When he realized just how little time each one of those very complicated aircraft is able to spend in the air as opposed to you know being repaired and how much the cost of maintenance is uh, for the for the fleet of f-35s most of which at any one time are being repaired they're not able to fly missions um and you know the flip side is that russia has continued with the soviet tradition of planning its military development by preparing to fight a defensive war against NATO weapons. So they've been, they've been looking at those weapons and working out the strengths and weaknesses of those weapons. Um, they have asked their te technicians to work out the simplest ways to defeat them and the cheapest, right? And their focus is on effective air defenses and development of hypersonic missiles, small drones. Um, you know, they now have technologies that the West doesn't, right? So it's a total reversal of roles. 
Um, whereas the Western arms companies have been focused on things that are more complicated and take longer to produce because then they can put more astronomical price tags on them. Great when no one's really at war and, and you're strutting the world saying, if you buy our stuff, you'll be invincible like us. Uh, all falls down very quickly in the realities of a war like the one that, that, that NATO is fighting against Russia in Ukraine. You know, Russian shells are cheap and quick to produce and the US ones are expensive and slow, right? Same with tanks. Russian tank production is ramping up really fast and it's got tanks which are really tough, maneuverable, quite simple to repair. The Western tanks are like the opposite and their artillery and their planes, right? Expensive, heavy, difficult to maneuver, um, break down easily and all the time um, and are very complicated to repair, you know? So we've got this um, reversal of roles, and it's completely against what had been expected sort of by any of us, really. Um, it's It's been quite a, quite a shock for everyone. And I think it's also been a shock to the junior imperialists, right, who had all assumed that they were safely sheltered under the, under the USA's massive military umbrella. They've allowed their own militaries to kind of dwindle away on that basis. And now they're finding that even if you take all of that together, all of their military industries of the whole of the collective West can't match what Russia produces, whether that's me measured by battlefield resilience or by volume. Um, and, you know, Russia has, because we aren't actually talking about economics here, we haven't even got onto the military things yet, but, you know, Russia's been able to utilise uh, its Soviet legacy because by renationalizing every aspect of arms production, uh, They've been able to focus their resources in a really efficient and targeted way, looking at the needs of the battlefield without having to worry about what makes a profit for the shareholders. Right. And also they have a legacy of a system where ramping up production in their factories is not a problem because they're, they were designed those factories in, an, in the Soviet era when all factories, all of industry in Russia was designed with ebbs and flows of demand in mind, yes? So um, they didn't go for maximum efficiency for maximum profit. They thought about what do people need? And the reality is that um, if you're gonna ramp production up and down in accordance to what demand is, you need factories which are bigger than the minimum size. You need a workforce which is bigger than the minimum. You keep it on standby and you leave, leave some of your machines idle or some of your factory space empty at certain times and then you know, you can ramp up very quickly and easily when you need to. And of course, that's exactly what Russia has been doing over the last two years. And the West, on the other hand, keeps talking about how they need to expand production, but they don't do it because it's without nationalization. There are just so many hurdles. They need more space. How will they make a profit if they're setting up expensive new facilities? How can they train enough new skilled labor? And that's a really big issue, right? How can they pay for the necessary warehousing? On and on and on. And it's just like we saw during the COVID-19 epidemic. You know, all the efficiency measures of the last four decades, uh, they boosted profits in the short term, but they've been shown to be really, really short-sighted and difficult to reverse in the long term. Um, another area that I think is critical that I'd like to you evaluate is the area of communications of propaganda, right? The, uh, the U.S. empire have said, you know, oh, Russia's evil, they're terrible. And they said the whole world is behind them. Well, it turns out that the whole world to them only consists of the U.S. and its vassals. And some of them are wavering, right? Um, outside of Europe and the U.S., even like I said, even inside of Europe, they have problems. But outside of Europe, the entire world is looking at them, saying, "Nah, we're not with you. We're with Russia." Right? Um, they've made an argument that Russia is. You know, it's funny. It's uh, it's it's not me. It's you. You know, it's not. We're not the ones putting out propaganda. Russia's the one putting out propaganda. We have to act to counter Russian propaganda, Russian misinformation, Russian disinformation. Meanwhile. The ghost of Kiev just shot down another 50 Russian planes. The Russians lost a million soldiers there. Somebody took a, uh, a Russian drone down. Some woman threw a jar of pickles, literally threw a jar of tomatoes or pickles out of her balcony and took a Russian drone down. So we listen to propaganda that's preposterous and actually, you know, just laughable. But they tell us they're countering Russian propaganda Whatever they're doing is not working. Not here, not even here in the United States, people are starting to wake up. Your thoughts on 
what they thought was a strength, soft power. And, 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 and I'll add this. And here's where it's critical. Look what's happening in Georgia. Normally, they could control everything, put NGOs in, control the do dominate everything. They would dominate the country and say, you can't stop us from this propaganda. Georgia says, now nah, we're shutting the door on that. You can't do the, your propaganda operations, your so-called soft power operation. You know, the whole soft power propaganda, that's starting to flop too. Your thoughts on how that's been exposed and or changed by the um, SMO. 100% Garland, you're so right. And you know, let's not forget that in reality, this is the one area where the West and the USA in particular actually has dominance, right? It's the thing they're, they're most practiced at and they have the most dominance over is the world media scape, right? Because they own the big tech companies and the big social media platforms. And, you know, in most of the world, um, people rely on those platforms, uh, those social media, the West owned social media platforms. You know, China has its own and Russia has its own. And I'm sure that massively helps their ability to remain sovereign. Right. But in most of the rest of the world, they're very reliant on Western um, controlled media for information. And, and you see that in many, many ways. So this is the one area where they really are dominant. And yet. And yet you're seeing the weakness revealed, as you said, you know, increasingly uh, the imperialists are being revealed to be liars, uh, that there's no evidence for the things they say. And, you know, that's one of the things that happens when a war goes on a long time is people start to, you know, things start to come up, lies start to be exposed and it all starts to get a bit embarrassing. You know, the NGO strategy you talked about in Georgia is starting to be exposed and recognized by people who are switched on. Of course, there are always people who are just manipulated by what seems to be a kind of overwhelming consensus. Um, but more and more people are becoming are becoming savvy and aware to what's going on. You know, um, and as you say, there's a distinct line around the world now between uh, the USA and its allies and vassals and the rest of the world is more and more alienated and more and more identifying with Russia and China, with the anti-imperialist camp overtly because of the way that this war is being fought and because of the way even the propaganda is being exposed, you know, and the fact that they're fighting this war in a propaganda focused way is something that actually is becoming a weakness for them because you know, they haven't been able to win outright military victories. And so the CIA and those who, who back the proxies in Ukraine have been directing the Kiev government to fight the war in order to create stories, to create PR opportunities. You know, so they use their dominance of corporate media and the social media platforms um, to try to make a story. They craft a narrative about the war that's like just pure Hollywood. You know, this happened, that, like you said, Ghost of Kiev, they, you know, endless, you know, and there's episode after episode in this kind of drip, gripping drama, right? But the overarching theme is that there's a heroic uh, and democratic Ukrainian David, and it's standing valiantly against the evil and dictatorial Russian Goliath, right? And they're inflicting all these blows under overwhelming odds, and they're acting as a bulwark for the enlightened liberal world against these evil, you know, kind of Asiatic despots who, for some reason, only known to themselves, want to destroy us, our civilization, our way of life. You know, all these American kind of themes about how we're the good guys. Um, but by fighting the war like this as a PR, PR exercise, um, NATO has been really, really reckless with the lives of Ukrainian soldiers. Not just thousands, not just tens of thousands, it, probably as many as a million. Let's face it, no one's actually counting Garland. Ukrainian men have been sacrificed on the altar of narratives, thrown into the firing line in ways that serve no military purpose whatsoever. I've heard you and Scott talk about this many times over. If you stop and think about how horrific that is, you know, the West is insisting on prolonging the war for propaganda purposes, despite the obvious reality they'll never be able to win, in the hope that if it goes on long enough, something will turn up, right? And the fact that while they're hoping something turns up, hundreds of thousands more Ukrainians are dying, 
they don't care about. And I think that's something really important that even for the Ukrainians, they've started to see that their friends don't care about them. And the absolute inhumanity of imperialism has been really highlighted by this as well. You know, their approach to waging the war in Ukraine is really a lot like the approach of the, the European generals in World War I, right? Who openly described their soldiers as cannon fodder and who just did not care how many thousands of men they threw into the line of automatic gunfire. Just, just walk that way. And if you try and turn around, we'll shoot you from this direction. You know, watching them being mown down. Uh, in order to see who is going to be able to get the lion's share of colonial looting when the fight's over. And that's what this war is ultimately about, too. It's about the US uh, and its allies, the imperialist camp, trying to maintain their right to loot the world. You're muted. Let me ask you this. I'm going to show you something, because um, I want to talk about what we've learned politically. Right. And I think this is a good example. Let me find it. This is uh, about the the leaders that are improved, uh, that are that are uh, produced by imperialism. OK, let's let's listen to this. Oh, she knows so long as she denied our freedom can never be secured. She knows so long as she was denied our freedom can never be secured she no lost she no so long as she was denied our freedom can never be secured i think we can learn something from that i'm not going to make a comment <laughs> i'm going to ask you what the that yeah she no lost she denied what can we learn about the kind of leaders uh, let me add this eu election looks what's happening Annalena Baerbach, if you remember, what did she say? We don't care about what the Germans think. I mean, MEP voters think we're going, we're, we're down with Ukraine. In other words, we're down with the U.S. The U.S. imperialism. And G Greens went from 20 percent to 12 percent. Macron is now at 24 percent and things are looking kind of bleak for him. Rishi Sunak, snap election. So this guy, this puppet is put uh, this avatar for the ruling elite is put forward. If I were the ruling elite, I'd be kind of embarrassed if this guy was, if this is the best I could do for an avatar and sitting behind him is Kamala Harris. What do we learn from Nide? <laughs> and might I add, there is a rumor that he had a very, shall we say, an unfortunate accident at the D-Day um, latest D-Day celebration, which wouldn't shock me. But at any rate, I'll throw it, I'll throw it uh, to you. I mean, I almost feel as a, he, he, in many ways, he doesn't deserve any consideration because when he was compost mentis, he was an evil bastard, right? But I feel sort of like it's too easy picking on Joe Biden. It's just elderly abuse and the guys, you know, lost it a long time ago. But you're right. What does it show us that he's the front guy for US imperialism, right? Well, it shows you two things. Number one, it's very hard for them to find convincing leaders to front up for their decaying system. Number two, it shows you that whoever sits in the chair in the Oval Office in the White House is not the person making the decisions. We actually could have learned that during the presidency of Donald Trump. But for the hard of learning, you're being taught it again by the presidency of Joe Biden. And of course, they're both in their different ways show up truths about US imperialism, uh, the reality of what that system is. And the fact that whoever it is who takes the decisions, the American people don't know who they are and didn't elect them. And um, they are uh, untouchable by. We, we don't have any influence over over. Oh, it's too horrible uh, over, you know, how they put into into office, uh, you know, the and the role of the media in presenting these people as if they are meaningful candidates, when the reality is that they're just, you know, people in suits to be manipulated, as you say, puppets to be manipulated by the real decision makers, the monopoly uh, financiers who really run the show in the imperialist world. And this 
we're in a time where there's a massive crisis of legitimacy for all politicians and media in the West who subscribe, um, who uphold this system, essentially. Uh, the mainstream parties in every country are taking a kicking. The media in Britain really wants to persuade us that there's a mass move to Labour and everybody's endorsing Keir Starmer for leader. But the reason they called the snap election is because they can see that that's in fact not the case. Labour is not um, being massively endorsed by the working class. Huge numbers of the workers have given up on voting, don't bother voting, and I think will not vote in this coming election. The more time that they allow to go by between now and when the election actually happens, all they're doing is giving space for this growing movement in Britain to provide independent candidates. And what do people mean independence? It's not just any old independence. They want people who are anti-NATO, anti-genocide, anti-Labour, right? That's actually, you know, the kind of main criteria for an independent uh, right now. And there's a massive movement to put independent candidates into all the constituencies. And the fact that they won't succeed in getting one in every constituency is because they haven't had enough time. And that's exactly why the snap election has been called, to stop them being able to get more campaigners, get more candidates and get attract more votes from working class people, uh, from the people who do still vote and even from some of the persuade some of the people who've given up voting that maybe they should vote this time because, you know, we can give Labour a kicking. Um, so you're seeing that, you know, the European election results, you know, showed the same trend, didn't they? All of the backers of these wars, those who are complicit in the genocides, those who have um, upheld NATO's policies over the last two years, they have all taken, taken a kicking. The sort of exception to that is, um, as far as I'm aware, and I could be wrong because I don't have a really detailed grasp of all the information, is uh, Maloney uh, in Italy, Georgia Maloney. And she's a kind of sit on the fence type. She's supposed to be, you know, and she was elected on an anti-immigrant, anti-NATO platform, which is the classic kind of right wing combo of like blame the poor but also pretend to be anti-establishment, right? And they, they put this thing together and it's demagogically, it works very well in harnessing the anger of working people who've been left behind by the parties, the working class parties that were supposed to represent them, right? And, and they feel disenfranchised and unrepresented and many of them fall for the lies about immigration. So this combination of anti-NATO and, and anti-immigration uh, convinces a lot of ordinary uh, poor workers that, that this is someone who, who's interested in them. So that's how Maloney was elected. Uh, she, as soon as she got into power, jettisoned her anti-NATO position and became very pro-NATO and played the game. But very recently, she started, she kind of drew a line in the sand and said, no, Italy is not going to join in with this sending long range weapons. We don't want to wage war against Russia. We don't want to be involved in this. Now, I don't know if that was a real hard position or if she had one eye to the election because she was the only one of the pro-NATO candidates who didn't take a kicking. So that to me was quite interesting. Um, but if I crisis... may, can I throw something at you? Yeah. Uh, the issue of immigrant. I think that's something that deserves a little bit of discussion for this reason. <clears throat> there are a lot of poor people in the US, working class, working poor, who have the issue of immigrant, who, who have an issue with immigration, not from a right wing perspective or from this perspective, from a labor perspective. There is a recognition, and I'm hearing it get louder and louder, that hey, these countries, they these leaders of ours, they go destabilize in this region, Guatemala, El Salvador, they destabilize the thing, this thing. These people come over, they bring unskilled labor in massive numbers in. The ruling elite leader then happy because it drives down the price of labor. So the laborers who make the least have more competition and they can drive down the cost of labor. And if you're a poor person, late, but you know, you've got more competition, you've got lower pay, right? And so there is that an anti-immigration from the perspective of we don't want different people here. Understand that more right wing. But there's also an anti-immigration who see it strictly as a labor issue and who also understand the uh, 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 dynamics of the ruling elite destabilizing whatever Africa, Middle East, 
driving refugees here and then using that for their capitalist machinations to lower labor, to lower the cost of, the, the, of labor. So I think I'm seeing more in the United States now a growing understanding of the dynamics of importing labor and bringing down the, the, the cost of low-skilled labor, that it is, isn't, say, so much racist and angry as it is angry at this capitalist move, movement to hurt the working poor. Your thoughts on that? I think there's a couple of things we have to recognize. One <clears throat> is that, you know, you're, when you fight against immigration in the situation of the world as it is, you are fighting with the symptom, not the cause. And you end up fighting the victim. And that only helps the ruling class. And we have to bear that in mind constantly. So if we don't want this endless downward pull on our pay and conditions, um, first of all, we have to be much more active in working to stop our ruling class's ability to wage those wars. It's no good just saying, oh, we don't like the wars, and then, but then being really active on the victims of the wars. Like, what are you actually doing, really, to stop this? Oh, you go, oh they're, active, they're, they're making our wages get worse. What did your union do to stop the ruling class from waging that war? It's not good enough if they're very, very active in trying to protect wages, pay and conditions, and they don't recognise how those two things are connected and they don't do anything to use their power as dockers or munitions workers or transport workers or supermarket workers or you know whichever media workers to actually stop the operations which cause all those problems in the first place to a whole load of people who were just sitting there right if i may throw someone else or something else in that just popped into my mind you inspired me to to make this comment <clears throat> because of something i've heard you say before here is what I see as the problem. Once a while back, we talked about the woke thing, the issue of, okay, you know, the issue of uh, fixing historical discrimination, sexism, whatever, right? But, uh, but allowing the ruling elite to say they're going to figure out how to fix it and they know the problem. That's absurd, right? Mm -hmm. Therein lies in the issue in, 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 in immigration. I'm upset with immigration because it lowers labor, whatever, right? Who am I asking to fix it? That if I have, I'm immigration problem, right? So I'm going to go to Congress or parliament the people who are doing the wars, the people who are working for the ruling elite to lower um, uh, 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 wages, right? I'm going to go to the puppets who are ordered to create these dynamics, to create the immigration problems and demand that they fix it. There goes the problem. You have to oppose imperialism, which is to bypass Congress and to go at the ruling elite. So uh, now that's what just popped into my mind. And I'm glad we had this discussion because it's, wait a minute, if I'm opposed to immigration, who am I asking to fix immigration? I'm asking the people who benefit from this and who work to make this happen to fix it. That just ain't going to happen. And that's what popped in my mind based on what you said and an earlier conversation that we had. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I thought it was an important comment. No, you're 100 percent right, Garland. You know, we are not going to get the capitalists to regulate their ability to get cheap, practically slave labor. They need it, they want it, that's how, and particularly at times of crisis, that's how they are keeping themselves profitable. And if they can't get immigrant labor that cheap inside their borders, they will just take their capital to where they can get it that cheap, right? So the idea that you say, no, stop the doors and we're gonna have good paying conditions here. What do you think happens? Just the export of capital becomes faster, right? And uh, the cost of your gardener goes up quite a lot. I mean, you know, literally that's it. Um, but, you know, so they're stopping the wars, right? You have to recognize, get to the root of the, of the problem. And there's also the question, you know, if the trade unions are so concerned about the fact that, you know, as they claim to be, and many workers fall for this argument, it sounds convincing, you know, oh, it's bringing down paying conditions. What have you really done to pull every single one of those, to create a situation where no migrant can work without union membership? Because if you had made that situation, there couldn't be a downward pull on your pay and conditions, could they? <laughs> if everyone was in the union, right? So again, what are you doing 
to make sure these people, these people need protecting too. They're working in the worst possible conditions, really, really vulnerable, really super, super exploited, and then looked down on by the people amongst whom they've come to live as some kind of a kind of burden and parasite when they're actually contributing more to the wealth of the country than the natives, right? They are victims twice over and then they're treated like dirt when they arrive, you know, as if they're trying to steal something when actually they work harder and take less from the state. They more of the wealth they produce is co-opted by the rich because their pay and conditions are so terrible and they don't get any state benefits. Right. So the whole thing doesn't make any sense. There's also another factor in the present situation we are, which is the decline of imperialism and the decline in sort of um, optimism, if you like of the citizens of the West, we have a demographic deficit. And the reality is, if we don't have immigrant workers coming to do lots of essential jobs in our countries, the social service uh, provision will collapse overnight, as would our government's ability to pay pensions and you know the health budget and whatever else. Because we sort of have this idea that, oh, I paid my dues for my pensions and now it's owed back to me, you know, and that sort of sounds right. But the reality is when you're paying into the pension fund or the national insurance fund or whatever, however your country system works, you are paying for the people who are being taken care of now. So when I pay pension contributions, I'm not saving up for my pension. I'm paying for the pensions of people who, who are taking their pension now. In the future, if I want the government to be able to pay me a pension, they'll have to be people who are paying in, right? And if the population just gets older and older and you don't have young people who are working, um, that equation stops functioning, right? There has to be population stability in society. And the reality is we have declining birth rates in all the Western countries and some worse than others, but in all across the board in the West, we have declining birth rates. And it's a problem economically for our economies to function. That is a massive problem, right? So again, um, in on many different levels, these people are needed. Now, if you look at um, the pulling down of people's paying conditions, you know, fundamentally, this is built into the workings of capitalism. There will always be unemployed under capitalism. We've talked about this before. You know, capitalism, by producing for profit, it pays the workers a fraction of the value they produce when they're at work. What does that mean? If you put it across society, what it means is all the products that are produced, the workers don't have the wages sufficient to buy back those products. Um, workers are then put out of work because the capitalists can't sell enough, the market's not big enough. You know, there's this whole situation where the advance of machinery and mechanization, which is driven by the desire to maximize profit, throws more and more people out of work, which shrinks the market further, which makes more production redundant, which puts more people out of work. This is capitalism. Capitalism has made it impossible for everyone to have a job. And it's the unemployed, ultimately, who act to pull down the pay and conditions of employed workers, because there's always someone who will take the job if you won't. And that was built into capitalism before there even was imperialism, right? Imperialism has just globalized the phenomenon. It's globalized it. And it's created that situation, you know, where there are, um, you know, if imperialism fundamentally is monopoly capitalism. It's this historically evolved process of capital in the earliest developed capitalist countries becoming too big to be able, the contradictions and the concentration of capital meant that the home market was no longer big enough for the big monopoly capitalists to, to keep making profits out of just a, a self-sufficient enclosed economy. They had to go abroad and they found they could make super profits doing that, you know, get bring the rate of profit up. So increasingly in Britain, this process of deindustrialization actually started at the end of the 19th century, which no wonder it's so advanced now and there are so few of us involved in actually making anything, right? Most of what's made and considered to be by, by British-based monopolies and what's consumed by British people is made somewhere else, right? What happens? Capital is taken somewhere where the land 
the rent, the, uh, the workers are cheap, where the government is weak, where their regulations are weak, where they can make a massive profit, the raw materials are cheap, they can make a massive profit, and they bring that profit back. And we live like leeches off the wealth that's been produced by workers who are working productively elsewhere. And increasingly, that's going from being a small section of the population to a huge, huge proportion of the population of the people in the West. You know, the service sector economies, what does that mean? It means we're all living off the, off the wealth produced by people somewhere else. You know, um, so that's the reality of what imperialism is. Um, why was I saying all of that? It was to do with immigration. It was to do with wars. Well, let's get back oh, yes. to export, oh, export, oh, export of capital. Right. is okay. a phenomenon of imperialism. They go where they can make the most profit. So they don't set up business just to please you or me or to keep the economy going or any other such thing. They set up business to make a profit. And if labor is too expensive in the home country, they set up their business elsewhere. Ex capital is, is gone. So to demand immigration controls, instead of recognizing that it's in the nature of monopoly capital to just go you know, to offshore industries wherever they, wherever they can because it will be cheaper and make more profit, it's crazy. You, know, you could kick every immigrant out and capital would continue to go to where the labor was the cheapest, right? So none of these equations make sense. If people can't see the whole system and they also can't see beyond the system, they think these relations are here forever. They think you can argue with the people who run the system and get them to see the sufferings of ordinary people, or they think you can legislate to make capitalism fair again, right? You know, like it never was, and you can't, right? And the people who, who are in government serve the monopoly capitalist class, they don't serve us and they're not responsive to our needs or our logic. They are responsive only to the desperate demand of capital to be able to make profit and maximize profit. Wow. Well, let us continue. Well, that, that, was, that was a great discussion. I picked up a lot from that for, as far as the immigration issue. Real, a few really powerful tidbits, in fact. Um, let's talk about, let's go back to what we've learned from the SMO, from the diplomatically. You know, the U.S., uh, it, what's interesting is this. The empire um, pretended to do diplomacy. But not, what we see now is it was never diplomacy. That a, a an ideology that's based on superiority, that's based on coercion, can't do diplomacy because the uh, diplomacy and coercion are um, the opposite of each other. So what do we see? We see China and Russia. We see three, the U.S., Russia goes and they talk to other countries, they meet with other countries. And what does China and Russia say? We want equality, mutual benefit, blah, blah, blah. Well, anybody can say that. The U.S. says that. But what the other countries see is, well, we got to deal with them and they didn't try to overthrow our government. Well, that's OK. I think we can do business with them. What did we learn diplomatically about the imperialists, about the anti-imperialists and these dynamics as a result of the SMO? You know the diplomatic weakness of the imperialist camp has been really exposed i think by the ukraine war increasingly we see the the sphere of influence of the usa shrinking down only to people who are you know totally financially dependent on it um the hypocrisy and the double dealing of the usa in particular but all of its imperialist allies has never been more evident than, for example, in the revelations about the Minsk process, which I mentioned earlier, you know, that was supposed to be a path towards a just and peaceful settlement of the Donbass people's struggle um, against fascism, right? But instead, it was just used by all the Western powers as a cover for continuing to build up Ukraine's military in preparation, not to end the war, but to expand it. And it's become really clear to independent minded states that the USA cannot be negotiated with. And it's not just Russia over Ukraine, right? It's the DPRK uh, in relation to the, so the, the, you know, the, the peaceful uh, road towards reunification in Korea. It's in regards to China and Taiwan. It's with regards to, um, oh, there was another one. It's just gone out. Iran, Iran, the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. 
Exactly. I knew there was another one. So in all of these really crucial areas of the world where the USA is actually pushing to war, there were supposedly peace process and negotiations on, ongoing right, to stop war happening. But it turns out in each case and with Oslo in Israel, you know, Palestine, it turns out that in each case, this uh, the imperialists word couldn't be trusted. Their treaties weren't worth the paper they're written on. The imperialists continue to be guided by the mindset of monopoly capitalism, right? That might is right. Um, and in the process, they're teaching, reminding people of Lenin's lesson, which was the imperialists understand no other language than the language of force, right? In which case, it turns out the only way to really answer them is to organize an oppositional force and using it uh, with determination that can't be ignored. Uh, you know, Sergei Lag Lavrov actually said this the other day. Uh, he said, well, I've got a quote from him. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me find it. Yes. From our experience with the Americans, it is perfectly clear that U.S. statements are not to be trusted. The Americans continue to make declarations about their commitment to a just solution to the Palestine problem while at the same time, generously adding fuel to the armed confrontation, right? And that's exactly what the Americans, the French and the Germans were all doing through the Minsk process of 2015 to 21. And what we saw afterwards, you're like, why is this war taking so long? And then we discover they've spent 10 years building trenches, massive armed fortifications across Ukraine. Why? There's only one reason. They were preparing for a war with Russia. All this stuff about this crazy aggressor Putin, but why was Ukraine covered in these fortifications? Why did they spend so long turning Ukraine's army into NATO's biggest trained force in Europe? Why? Russia wasn't trying to do anything to Ukraine. Ukraine wasn't under threat from anybody. They were planning war with Russia. That's what all of those preparations were about. Um, and as a result of kind of realizing this, um, there's another realization that goes along with it, isn't there? Which is there is no way to remain safe from imperialist hostility if you also want to remain sovereign, right? You can you can just surrender, right? But if you want if you want the right to take care of your own country your own way, if you want the right to decide your own government, you will never be safe from imperialist hostility. So the anti-imperialist countries have had to in light of all of this, make big advances in all their bilateral and their multilateral relationships. And that's happening at an ever increasing rate. And, you know, despite all the differences in ideology and outlook, we're looking today at an anti-imperialist camp that's stronger than it has been since the death of Joseph Stalin in 1953. And you know, in economic and technological terms, it's stronger than it's ever been. And imperialism is weaker than it's ever been, right? So the balance of forces in the world is reaching this really decisive tipping point in history. And, you know, at the same time, we see how the lies, the double dealing and the hypocrisy of the West are being exposed. And so the rulers of the West and the system they preside over is really faced with this deep and deepening crisis of legitimacy. And I said, that's happening. We see that happening at home. We see it in all the election results at the moment and the political crises that every single government is in. But we're also seeing it abroad, you know, with so many lies about their wars being exposed. Um, we're also seeing that the imperialist countries can't recruit enough professional soldiers to keep their armed forces going. You know, they can't withstand any political fallout that comes from dead soldiers coming home because the wars are so unpopular. Um, that's why they have a strategy now of using proxy forces everywhere, right? So Middle East, East Asia, Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, everywhere. They've, they're working hard to build proxy armies. But look how much work went into creating the Nazi uh, gangs, the Banderite, the Nazi collaborators in, um, in Ukraine. You know, they spent decades nurturing, you know, Nazi expats. They rewrote Ukrainian history. They brainwashed a whole generation of Ukrainian people. That took a really long time to do all of that, to create this winning, willing cannon fodder, right, for their war against Russia. Um, they armed fascist street thugs to um, forcibly suppress the people who stood up against all of that, you know, whether they were Russians, communists, trade unionists, or just 
you know, people who wanted to speak out and defend the rights of workers and were just wanted to tell the truth in politics or the media, right? But two years into their war, they have destroyed a huge number of those forces, whether um, through death or just through being exposed. And Ukrainian men today increasingly don't believe that America is their friend. They're no longer willing to be sent to the front lines. They're hiding to keep away from the recruiters. Um, and now we're getting this widespread talk across the West now about the need to start building conscription armies. And that's actually coming from a position of weakness because uh, they're not able to get the, get the fodder they need for their wars any other way. So they're determined to keep fighting wars and they're trying to work out how to do that when even their proxies can be destroyed so quickly when they can't recruit professional soldiers. You know, two years ago, um, government, not just governments, but lots of the people in Poland, Latvia, Lithua, Lithuania, Estonia, they'd all been uh, brainwashed the same way as the Ukrainians. They were kind of lining up to join this fight against Russia. They would had their heads filled with Russophobic and pro-Nazi propaganda. Their media and politicians were always telling them how NATO's with us forever, right? And they were gonna, they're gonna back us to the hilt, we'll have a speedy victory, then we'll be lording it over these evil Russians. And of course, now this kind of fervor is really subsiding and there's a real lack of enthusiasm, even at governmental level, um, because they've seen what NATO backing really amounts to, right? Lots of words of support, uh, you know, quite a lot of weapons, but not enough weapons. And this kind of exhortation that you keep on fighting to the last Ukrainian. Yeah, we're right behind you. We're with you for as long as it takes. Oh, no, we're not really for as long as it takes. We're for as long as we can until it until it becomes a bit difficult and then we're off. Right. And you can destroy your country in the process. So this this I think this debate around conscription in the West is a really a sign of desperation that they can't find uh, the, the, the willing cannon fodder for their wars um, and also show us that they haven't given up on their goal of destroying Russia and China. They're casting around trying to see, well, this hasn't worked now. Now, what do we do? But, you know, a lot of people, they look at the drive to war against China, which we can see ramping up right in front of us, even as they're losing, losing badly in Russia, losing in the Middle East, even though the war hasn't taken regional hold yet. It's obvious that they're beaten and they can't win there. And yet they're ramping up to war against China. And a lot of people look at that situation with the logic of a human being and go, well, they won't be as crazy. They're not going to be that crazy. Like, it's obvious they can't. Of course, they can't beat China. Why would they? But the problem is you think with the logic of a human being and not the logic of a capitalist. Of course, it doesn't make sense. But the capitalists aren't capable of learning those lessons. They have. We have a phrase in English. I don't know if you say it in America. They're damned if they do and damned if they don't. You say that too? Right. Yes. So, so. If they do go to war against China, they can't win. But if they don't go to war against China, their global dominance is definitely over. So they're in this bind. And so what do they do? They push towards war anyway and just keep hoping. Right now, we can see them massively advancing their preparations on the Korean Peninsula and all across the South China Sea to make war with the DPRK, with China. They couldn't win one of those wars on its own, never mind both of them together. You know, And they're trying to create strong proxy forces. So they're militarizing Australia, Japan, the Philippines, uh, Taiwan at a massively advancing rate, huge uh, uh, military exercises happening literally sort of every other week, get bigger and bigger and bigger. They're rehearsing every type of nuclear exercise, every type of decapitate the government of the DPRK, you know, uh, I don't know, could control the South China Sea, all these type of operations. Um, clearly they're driving as hard as they can and they're not going to let go of this of this plan so you know people of the world i think workers have to recognize and increasingly are realizing that there's no way to mollify or pacify these lunatics there's only one way out of this and that is through it's through the defeat of the imperialists that we get to the other side of sanity and development and prosperity that we all really desperately want you know, another thing I think if I'd like to get your comment on is that what we're learning. Imperial, imperialism is at a fundamental level incompa incompatible with democracy, incompatible with not just the rule of the masses or the control of the masses, but with um, the government having any alignment or representation 
of the masses. We're looking at China, you know, and I've been bringing this up. I think Iran is somewhere between 45 and 50 percent of the people who support, you know, have a, a, a favorable approval of the government. Now, people are like, that's low compared to the United States. You know what I mean? You couldn't. The, the number is so low here that, I mean, we don't have enough decimal points to show how low it would be. Right. Russia right now, Putin's 87 percent of the uh, 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 vote. China, 97, 90 percent plus 90 to 95 percent of the people support their government. What we're seeing is the anti-imperialist countries. The people are looking at their everyday life. Hey. I got a job. I feel fairly economically secure. We're getting an education. My kids can go to college. They're not pushing the whole woke, you know, thing, agenda, which people have a lot of issues with. Um, and they feel as though there is some, that, that people in the anti imperialist countries feel as though my government has some concerns with economically and culturally, you know, my wishes. Okay. In the uh, imperialist countries, they're ramping up on censorship. We've got to shut the voices of our people up. They're yelling too loud. They're pointing out our flaws. They're pointing out our errors. They're pointing out things. And so now you have in Germany, you have in the US, you have in the UK people saying, you know, two cheeks of the same butt, basically, when they talk about, you know, the ruling parties are not in opposition e anymore. We want something else, but there's no other parties. They won't let a third party come in. They won't let other options. So what are we learning about but the difference between the anti-imperialist countries and the imperialist countries politically and how imperialism affects your the possibilities of representation for the masses? It's a really good question. You know, you could sum it up with a line out of Lenin's book on imperialism, which he wrote in 1916, right? And uh, there's one sentence where he just says, imperialism seeks domination, not democracy, right? And that should just be, you know, make it your screensaver, put a poster on the wall. Like, you know, just that message needs to get home to people. And increasingly, it is getting home to people that um, this system is not about democracy for the masses. Democracy has always only ever been uh, democracy for a certain class. Uh, in every um, type of society, uh, you will have uh, participation by one class and a, and a lack of participation by the exploited uh, other class. Um, in a capitalist society, democracy is democracy for the capitalists. And the more that Capitalism develops into monopoly capitalism, and the and the more concentrated capital becomes, the real participants in the democracy become fewer and fewer. And even big capitalists find themselves outside the decision making process, and they start. There's a bit of it's a lot of where the kind of Nigel Farage, Donald Trump kind of rebelliousness comes from, right? They they harness the masses behind them in their complaints because the masses are also disenfranchised. But really, it's the complaint of the big capitalist who's not big enough anymore because monopolies become so enormous and concentrated that you can even have you know 100 million and be kind of a nobody when it comes to the decision making process and that's the position of people like uh, trump and that's the position that, that farage kind of represents you know in britain um they represent the 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 anger of um uh, smaller capital at being shut out of the decisions but they still have to pay the taxes to fund you know, whatever decisions are taken, uh, being shut out of decision making in a very advanced capitalist economy, right? They're no longer part of the really ruling elite. Um, in a monopoly capitalist, I mean, in any capitalist society, but the more it advances, the more that time passes, you know, just it's a historically evolving situation, right? The more that capital concentrates, the more the deck is stacked the more unequal, you know, inequality is baked in from day one of capitalist production because the worker is getting just enough to reproduce himself and all the extra wealth he produces that go beyond paying for his wages are given to his employer for free. So every day that his employer is an employer, he's getting a bit richer. Well, the, cap the, the, the worker, if he's lucky, is staying at the same level and very often he's going down because of other conditions. 
So this inequality is baked in from day one of capitalist production. As time goes by, it just gets bigger. It just gets wider. We now have this situation where, again, you know, the kind of petty bourgeois liberal do-gooders wring their hands over it and they want laws, they want regulation. Oxfam produces these reports. They've actually stopped presenting their facts in the same way, Oxfam, because it's getting too embarrassing. You know, but there was a period where each year they would bring out a report that said this many people have as much wealth as half the world's population. And they sort of, they got to eight, right? Eight multi-billionaires between them have the same wealth as half of the world's population. And then they stopped presenting the evidence in exactly that way anymore, because obviously the number just keeps getting smaller, you know? And that, to expect that there is possibility of equality in a system like that, is clearly insane you know we don't have equal uh starts we don't have equal access we don't you know i can't express my views in the mainstream media uh i certainly don't like jeff bezos own a newspaper you know i don't have connections with the secret services i can't i can't like um oh, what's his name the tesla guy musk i can't like elon musk tell the CIA that we need a coup in Bolivia because I need access to their lithium, lithium at a better price, right? You know, that I don't have the same access as these people have. Um, and these aren't even the richest, they're held up to us as the richest people in the world because they're the ones we're allowed to know about. I don't believe they really are, right? So, and if you look at the whole, you know, what we are given instead to distract us in the West, you know, this whole thing, the culture wars that don't plague Russian and Chinese societies, or Iranian, or definitely not North Korean. What's the function of the woke debate? What's the function of the immigration debate? Why are they so heated? Why is it all heat and no light? Why is it so impossible to just talk facts in these, uh, in these discussions? Why is it all emotion? Because not only is it a massive distraction, its whole function, in fact, is divide and rule. It's keep the idiots, keep the plebs shouting at each other, right? We're sort of like the circus, you know, and the, and the super rich are up there throwing, you know, bait in to make us a bit more crazy. And they are the masters. The one thing they're really, really good at is they're masters of emotional manipulation. Their propaganda heads to here. I saw you talking here. I mean, like, you know, the what do you call that bit? The primal bit of your brain, right? Right. Goes straight past your frontal cortex connects to here, no thinking, no reasoning, just an emotional response and a tribal response. You know, I, I, I'm on this side and I hate the other side. I and mean, here we are all, all bashing each other up, right? We have suppression, not participation uh, in our countries now, you know, because the truth is being outlawed. You're not allowed to say simple facts. It's hate speech to say that uh, a woman is an adult human female. I mean, for goodness sake, you, know, you couldn't make it up, could you? And yet... And yet we're encouraged to get into big emotional debates about that, not to stop and think for a minute and say, in what world is it in somebody's interest to make such simple statements um, controversial? How did it become controversial? Who's, who's making this happen? Who's policing this? This did not come from the ground up. This is not a mass movement for liberation. What is it? Where did this come out of? You know, and the and the immigration debate, you know, it it is very much aimed at playing on the insecurities and the fears of workers who are seeing their standards of living go down in imperialist countries, who are at the bottom of the pile, who are treated badly, who are live in constant insecurity. So their life is full of fear, and their fears are played on with this very emotive propaganda. I saw you talking um, to I can't remember who uh, about. Um, the video that was made of um, Zelensky, President Zelensky in Ukraine, the actor, the stooge fake actor president of Ukraine, right? CIA puppet dude, uh, recently put out where he was asking for a peace summit, right? Asking President G, please come and talk to us. Um, and you were talking about the Hollywood production of it. And what I noticed about that was, you know, when they want to manipulate our emotions, the use of music, in the, they didn't just do all the nice production and shooting, to, but they put a musical soundtrack on the bottom of it to kind of the kind of uplifting bit and the, and the serious bit. And, the, you know, 
that's what they're really masters of. You know, it's the one real skill that they've been working at for a really, really long time is how to manipulate us emotionally so we don't allow our thinking brain to engage or our thinking brain just gets bypassed and we don't even realize that's happened. And then we end up, you know, very often when you have a strong emotion, it's very natural to, to rationalize why you have the emotion. So rather than first thinking and then coming to a conclusion and then, you know, letting your emotions do whatever they're going to do, we have this back to front situation where you have the emotion first and then you're like, well, I'm feeling really wound up. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling, and then it's like, well, who's to blame? Why do I have this emotion? And then, of course, they, they, they put it in front. This is why you're feeling this. And you're like, okay, that's why I feel it. And, you know, so people think that they've reasoned their way to something when they haven't. They've just been given an emotion. And then they've been given a rationale for the emotion. And it sort of seems convincing, you know. And that's very much what we, what we see with the imperialist propaganda machine. It's all emotive. And that's why the hysterical propaganda that accompanies their war drives can feel so difficult to overcome. It's because the people you meet have been emotionally stirred up. They don't have any facts at their command, but they have an, if you try to bring a fact into the conversation, they have an emotional response to you. They don't want to hear it. And they just get angry with you as the deliverer of the fact. It's the classic shoot the messenger, you know, oh, how dare you? Oh, you're a, you, you think it's okay to be the evil Putin's friend. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what are you saying? No, 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 no go away, I can't talk to you. You know, it's all that. Um, but that's that's what they're left with. And the problem with that type of mechanism is once people start to realize what's been done with them, they get angry. When they realize they've been fooled, when they realize they've been manipulated, they get angry and then they're never coming back to you. You know, so it's a it's a it's a mechanism that works for as long as it keeps enough people inside the bubble. But the numbers of people who are falling out of the bubble are going to increase. They're going to have impacts on the people around them. It's no longer the case that everybody believes. And the more people who don't, the more difficult it is for those who are still in the bubble to maintain their status in the bubble. There's too much conflicting information um, that's, going to pull, that's going to pull them out. One last thing. I know we've been on a long time, but one last thing I'd like to throw at you. I think it's critical in the context of this conversation. Gaza, and I'll tell you why. Because we talked about what we learned from the SMO, but one thing regarding Gaza, you know, people like us knew who the imperialists were. We're not shocked when people talk about I rem when Joe came, Biden came on. I'm like, well, you understand we've got a guy who's been complicit in genocide over and over again, who's the president now. How can we say any other leader of any other country is bad? I, we knew who he, he were, who he was. We knew the system. Right. OK. What Gaza has done now, I've had callers on some of my radio shows and they'll say, yeah, but the Republicans this and the Democrats, they're making a, you know, a, an argument that the Democrats are better than the Republicans. And I've said, they're both complicit in a genocide. What are you talking about? And I've had caller, callers stop and say, ah, yeah, I guess you're right. Right. That's important that I've been able to utilize the Gaza genocide as a tool of enlightenment. Right. To say, how can you and I've made this point, how can you believe that during covid these people were looking out for your best interest when they're genocidal lunatics and they're risking your life now in nuclear war? How can you think they were trying to look out for your life then? Right. How can you think that there were anytime someone implies that the imperialists are doing something good? I point to Gaza. Oh, sorry, I'm not pointing to you. Gaza's over there in that, that wrong direction. Gaza's in that direction. The good, the good person's in that direction, right? Look at this. And you're telling me that these people have some moral high ground against anyone? Gaza, uh, the, 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 the genocide there has made it, has, uh, I'm going to put this in a way that I'm not comfortable with, but it, it, makes, it makes sense from the perspective of how I'm using language. It has been a valuable to moral tool in allowing me to point to don't make an argument that these people are doing anything good ever or that they're ever looking out for the little guy they're creating they're in the process of a genocide. And it shuts people down because people are like, yeah, but uh, yeah, I guess you got a good point there. You know, your thoughts on. Gaza, the, mor the the moral argument and how that's hurt the imperialist. 
hundred percent, Garland. You know, like you say, many of us were already aware of um, the true motivations, the true nature of the system, and of the kind of people who serve the system. But that wasn't the case for vast majority of people in the West. Gaza has really changed things because so many people in the West are plugged in. Now that we have to remember that many people are not not plugged into what's happening and not sort of part of this mass awakening, but the numbers who are are substantial and increasing. And when you watch live on your phone delivered to you, you know, 24/7 day after day after day for 8 months obvious genocidal war crimes when you see you know the the icj making pleas for israel to stop and to say look this looks this really looks like it probably is a genocide and you really have to stop everything you're doing while we look into it further and no more no more action no, no more of any of these actions you've been doing please uh, and they just carry on and not just they just carry on but the USA, which pretends to be the peacemaker and the neutral arbiter rather than the puppet master behind the whole thing, makes excuses for them in public. And even if it was pretending every now and again to disagree with something they've done or be, you know, it keeps delivering weapons day after day after day after day. Right at the beginning, every single political leader in Europe and the USA rushed to Israel to stand next to Netanyahu and have their photograph taken with him and say, we're with you 100%. Uh, because they know that uh, their ruling classes are Zionist to the core, not because the tail wags the dog, but because they need to keep controlling the Middle East and Israel is the way that they do it. Right? Israel is their proxy force, but they need to protect it. Right. So all the imperialist politicians know that they have to be good Zionists if they want to get the job of running British or German or French or US imperialism. Um, but the utter hypocrisy of these leaders has never been more clear than when they talk about democracy and human rights and then send plane and shiploads of weapons to fuel what is clearly a massacre of innocence in Gaza. You can't describe it as anything else if you are actually paying attention. Okay, if you just read the mainstream newspaper, you might be a bit a bit confused and, and a bit ambiguous about, ambivalent about what's happening and a bit, you know, 50-50, you know, because of the way the mainstream media tries to present it. But for all those people and growing numbers of people are plugged into the actual evidence then they are seeing not just how uh, hypocritical and lying the politicians are, but also the media. And this is something that had already been growing for two decades before now, and is really coming to kind of full fruition in this moment. And we have this real uh, kind of uh, explosion of, um, uh, of, uh, of uh, phenomena, which is on the one hand, you know, the the growing crisis of legitimacy of the politicians, the growing crisis of legitimacy of the media, the real-time suffering of the Palestinians, their, their, their um, staunch resilience, and yet the, the horrendous suffering they're facing and the fact that this is all being covered over, whitewashed, lied about, and fueled by, by our politicians. And, of course, the cost of living crisis, the inflation crisis in the West that means people's living standards are going down. And... All of these things act together to show us the nature of the system and the fact that the people who, who we think run it are servants of people who are higher than them. And they are prepared to be totally hypocritical, um, totally inhuman. They will commit any crime to keep their job. And when they're auditioning for their job, they're not auditioning to us. They're auditioning to the higher ups, right? And they will do anything to be allowed by the higher ups to have these jobs. They will commit any crime in the interests of imperialist profit. Uh, they are utterly servile to the ruling class and totally uninterested, totally uninterested in the lives of ordinary people. And that could be ordinary people, ordinary workers at home, as we saw with COVID, as we see with, uh, you know, uh, 
the inflation crisis and the, and the total lack of any program to intervene and save people from slipping into dire poverty. Nothing, nothing at all. Just, oh dear, what a shame. And their total inhumanity and, and lack of regard for life abroad could not be more clearly indicated than by what's happening in Gaza. I mean, you ought to be able to have seen it, as we talked about earlier, from the way that they throw soldiers' lives away in Ukraine. Probably a million men, Garland, thrown, just sacrificed in the cause of profit, in the hope, in the hope that maybe some damage will be done to Russia that helps to tip, uh, tip things in their favour. Even after it was really obvious very early on that there's no way they could win a, a, a military confrontation. They, they kind of just hoped somehow between economic measures and, and just keeping the war going, something might happen. Right? But a million men, it's OK. After we've run out of Ukrainians, we've got Polish, we've got Latvians, we've got, the, you know, they're like that with, with people's lives. And with Gaza, it's so clear. You know, they can stand there, Kirby and all these awful people can stand there and make these utterly vapid, lying statements, but you can put the statement next to the thing that's happening. And, and anyone who wants to know can find out pretty easily that every single day they're making these hypocritical statements about wanting peace, the US government is sending a boatload and a plane load of heavy weapons out to Israel so they can keep bombing. Jody Barr, thank you very much. We've been, we went a little bit over today, but I think we had a lot of important things to cover. And I really did want to um, talk about that last particular issue regarding uh, Gaza because I thought it was pertinent and it just fit right into this particular conversation. Jody, uh, once again, uh, let everyone know where they can find your stuff online, how they can follow you, how they can you know follow your good works. Best way to follow me is on Telegram. Uh, and it's just my channel, Jyoti Bra. Uh, my party is also there, The Communists. Um, I like Telegram the best, so go there. And if you want really decent news and analysis, go to my party's website, thecommunists.org. Do you still have, what is it, proletarian TV or something like that on oh, YouTube? Thank you. <laughs> Bless you for remembering that. I'm terrible. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you like the YouTubes, then um, subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is Proletarian TV. Great. Everyone, don't forget. Um, uh, uh, follow me on Rumble, follow me on Rockfin, and uh, also on Twitch, whatever Twitch is. I don't, I don't know anything about it, but I suspect I'm broadcasting on it because StreamYard says that. Um, and most importantly, share this on all, uh, hit, smash the old like button and share this on all your social media platforms. That's what's critical. That's what's important. Share it on all your social media platforms so people can hear um, a, 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 a different perspective. Um, a unique perspective and um, get an opportunity to hear the argument against imperialism. Thank you very much, Jody Bra. Uh, uh, and thanks everyone. Um, don't forget to share this and I'll be back soon with uh, other great shows. I had a great show, by the way, Jody, last night. We had a guy, if you get a chance to watch it, Dr. Peter Kuznick. He is a um, historian. He actually did a great, uh, he did a great documentary with Oliver Stone about history. And so he's a specialist on history, nuclear history. We talked about a, a lot of great stuff on the uh, attacks on and the, 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 what happened prior to and around the uh, nuclear attacks on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And he also talked about the Soviet Union and WW2 and D-Day and what people should have known as opposed to what they, it was a good show. I would recommend it to a lot of people. Uh, I think a lot of your followers, a lot of people in your party will really enjoy that. So uh, thank you very much, Jody Barr. Everybody, share this on all your social media platforms. We're out.